I think of Jeff's voice as being kind of like the humble badass sort of like, you know, you have the, we're in a market where there's a lot of money going around and there's a lot of people who can go from, you know, sort of unknown. And then they do a, you know, they do a $4 million launch or whatever. And it's like, so we're, we're not targeting the people for the most part. We're not targeting the people who are, okay, they do the million dollar launch and, you know, they've got all the Instagram clips and they're, you know, rolling up in the brand new Lamborghini and stepping out in the thousand dollar sneakers and, you know, kind of flashing like, you know, hey, I'm in this place with this person, I'm in this place with this person. You know, it's the guy who's, you know, walking into the local breakfast joint in a t-shirt and, you know, just kind of sits down, has his cup of coffee, and whips out a laptop and writes an email and makes a million bucks you know it's like that sort of like that understated sort of badass type feel i think that's that's who our audience wants to be all right hello launch family so happy to have you listening in on today's episode our topic today is copywriting and as usual i am joined by my co-host and i wouldn't hesitate to say a master of copywriting mr jeff walker Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're also joined by our uh, two of our amazing team members today, actually. So we're going to give you a little peek behind the curtain of our own team on this episode. Uh, to my right, we have our resident marketing campaign designer, um, one of our experts in copy and general marketing guy on our team, Mr. Justin Livingston. <laughs> Are you uh, muted right now, Justin? Oh, yeah, that's right. I That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> welcome. I said to something the show. really brilliant. I forget what it is. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. And also uh, to my left, I have our marketing lead, a uh, copywriter and video pro, and also our chief kitten provider, Mr. Dan Walker. Hey, everybody. <laughs> It's really great when everyone just waves on an audio podcast. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Closed captions all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, if uh, if you're not listening to this, uh, you got all of the full experience of it. Um, so today, uh, our topic is a big one. It is copywriting, and I'm guessing it's one that a lot of people are going to want to really turn uh, tune into and be excited to hear from uh, from us on. But, uh, but Jeff, did you want to give some context for, yeah, uh, our, yeah. our team and who we are and, and, and why we're the ones talking about copywriting? <laughs> oh, um, well, that's an interesting. So first of all, copywriting, let's, let's just define it real quick. That's, that's putting words on a page to try to convince people to do something as opposed to going and getting your work copywritten by the, by, by the government to protect your intellectual property. So it's, I've seen people confuse those things. We're talking about the the magical skill, the magical technique of being able to put words. And it used to be put words uh, on on paper. That, that's that back when copywriting was invented. It was put words on paper and get people to do stuff, primarily to give you money for an for an offer for a product that you've got. And so, you know, these days copy can be the, the, the words you say on a video, they could be the, what you put in social, wherever, but copy is this idea of, of how you express yourself through words and get people to take action. And it's, it is truly a magical superpower. And uh, because if you're good at it, then you can literally write your own income, write your own business, write your own impact. It's, it's, it's amazing. And so I guess the reason why we sort of behind that question, Chris, you had this, there's like, who, who the hell are we to talk about it? <laughs> um, and, and so I started an online business in the, in the mid 90s. And uh, then, and, and it was very successful. And then I started teaching people how to market in 2005. I came out with my product launch formula. And basically I've been teaching people how to build online businesses since then. So I've been at this for a long time. And, and, but the way I found myself into this world is, well, I was desperate when I started my business. And I was, I was desperate to make some kind of an income because I, it's been a long time since I'd made an income. I was a stay-at-home dad. 
and um, with my wife supporting the family. So I learned about this idea that really it was about copywriting. And so I started studying old school copywriting and, and some of the, the core principles go back literally a hundred years now. And I went back and I studied the old school stuff and realized it would all translate to the online world. And that's what gave me a, an early leg up. So now I lead this, you know, I lead this company. We've got this team of 40 people. We've got, we've had over a million people go through our free training. We've had tens of thousands of people go through our paid training. We've got these incredible communities. And it's all because long ago, 25 years ago, I started studying copywriting and I got good at it. So that's why I feel like that's why we're here um, to share some of this with you. That's why I feel like I'm at least somewhat qualified. And I just want to give a little context to the people we have on the call here. In addition to my co-host, Chris, is uh, is Dan Walker. And Dan is um, someone who, uh, well, he's my son. And I started teaching him. I, I remember I had this friend who, like, his dad taught him how to be a diesel mechanic. And he and and this his son was clearly on this path to like be, he literally became like a rocket scientist, like literally. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious, like he's literally set him on the path right off. Yeah. The bat, in right? fact, <laughs> beyond that, he, he's, to tell you the truth, he's he's actually an astronaut. Now he's been to the space station three times, but his dad thought, you know, this kid looks like he's got a future, but I'm going to teach him how to be a diesel mechanic because he's going to, always going to have a skill to fall back on. And so with my son, when he was a teenager, I'm like, I'm going to give him a skill he can always fall back on. I'm going to teach him how to write copy. And, and we went through a whole process on how to, on teaching him that. And then he actually started writing copy for our some of our campaigns, some of our joint venture copy, like when he was still a teenager. And um, and so he's got a long history of, of copy. And then um, and then Justin Livingston. So I have this Platinum Plus as my mastermind. I started in 2010. I think Justin joined it in 2011. And back in those days, everyone had these businesses doing 100000 or $200,000 a year. And and Justin joined, and there was a big race within the group. They were very competitive with each other to see who could do the first million dollar launch. And I don't know, about a year and a half into the into the program, someone got the first million dollar launch, and another person did a million dollar launch, another million, and then Justin came in and did a four point one million dollar launch. Justin, I'm gonna guess that was 2014 or somewhere around there. I think um, so. Yeah. Yeah, so so the, you know so and, and, jump and it, there. That's a pretty huge jump. It, it was. <laughs> it, it 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 was. It definitely set the bar in that group. And so Justin, someone who is just you know um, just amazing with copy, with offers, with how to structure the actual offer and uh, and, and present that offer through copy. And so that's why we thought we'd be fun to have a conversation about copy with with the four of us. How was it walking in the room being the guy who just did a four million dollar launch? That's got that's got to be pretty cool, Justin. It was it was it was amazing, but the the downside of it was um, we won't say by who, but that launch got beat pretty <laughs> shortly thereafter, and and was beat many times by people in that group. So the uh, yeah the prestige was short lived. Though you know maybe it'll be like the four minute mile. You know maybe maybe I'll be famous forever for that. But uh, it. Um, you are now, Justin. Yeah. You, you are, you're, you're, it's We're commemorated now for the it. public. I mean, <laughs> you're just the one that showed him what was possible. <laughs> I guess so. Well, well, once you get that standard, that you set a new standard for everybody, and not a small one, right? Like, I mean, that group now, I mean, it's definitely been beaten many times over and by a whole many lot times. more than just that. But, uh, but to jump from you know one to three, that's a huge, huge uh, jump, and probably had a huge impact on people. Copywriting is uh, something, I'll, I'll just say, for context, I'm not a copywriter, but I'm a salesperson, so I'll be playing sort of the role of the listener here, I think, in asking these questions and sort of guiding this conversation, because um, my guess is that we're going to get some people who know copywriting tuning into this episode, but we're also going to probably get a lot of people who, this may be their first exposure to 
What are the ins and outs of copywriting? Where should I even start? What are the things I should be thinking about as I go into launching my own business? It's like one of those skills you should have as a business person in the online space, but many people just may not know exactly where to start or what it is that they should be looking at. So to start yeah. off, I'd be curious, what are like to start this conversation, like why is copy so important and why should people have enough skill sets in it to just at least be able to, to understand what good copy is? Um, I'll jump in. Um, and, and I think the last part you said is important because you can get people to write copy for you. And there's a long history of people being freelance copywriters, but if you're going to hire copy, you at least have to be able to recognize good copy. And so I'm assuming we're speaking now to people that are in this digital world. Uh, you know, they're building some type of a, a, a business with some type of a digital component, or maybe it's a solely digital. And copy is all we have. The only thing we have is our ability to communicate through electronic means, whether it's it's on video, on uh, social, in email, on a webinar, uh, on a on a live event, maybe a, a virtual event. All we've got is words, and those and those words are copy. And so this is a, a core principle of mine: is that everything is copy. Everything is copy. Like every message you put out, it might not be going for the sale, but everything you do is copy, and it's it's literally all we have. So, yeah, you got to get good at it. I, I'd just say, like, if you think about any, like, personality that you um, that you know, I'm doing no in quotes because it's, like, anyone you feel like you know, whether it's someone you follow online, whether it's someone you follow on Instagram or you watch their YouTube videos or you consume their content, you buy their courses or anything, like, the entire perception that you have about that person. Like, you know, when you follow someone really close on social media and it kind of feels like almost like, you know, them, like, you know, their life, like you almost could sit down to dinner and like be friends with them. That entire perception of them is because of their copy, their copy and their positioning. It's the way that they present themselves to the world. You know, Chris, you were saying that you're not a copywriter. Um, I, I don't know if the listeners know your, um, your expertise and your, that your level of expertise when it comes to the sales process and um so in do they know that has that been i don't know if they, they, you, they, you they, when they hear the sales or? episode it'll probably it'll probably <laughs> become apparent yeah uh there's yeah. another episode we're doing on sales where i will be speaking a lot more on my authority there but yes uh we'll okay learn that. so we'll listen to that episode <laughs> okay so whether the, the listeners know or not know um you know they will just Take it. Uh, Chris is a badass. Chris, I'm, Chris. I'm prepping for a compliment right now. I'm just <laughs> waiting for it to hit. I... <laughs> oh, there's no compliment coming. I'm just oh, no. Okay. <laughs> he, he, he's, he's got some reps. Chris has got some reps. Yeah. He's done a little bit of selling in, in, in difficult environments. So <laughs> my point is that, you know, one thing that you would know, Chris, or for anyone that is great at sales or understands sales, that there's, um, that the community, the, to master the the selling is in in the communication, you know, and asking the right questions, these types of things. But for me, that what it does many things, but one of the primary functions of 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 um, what you say and how you say, what questions you ask in a sales process is to create intimacy. So I anyway, won't we'll dig into what that word means, but um, you know, in marketing, it's this crazy notion that uh, you, you're going to create this intimacy with an individual, but without being present. So it's kind of a, it's a ridiculous notion. You can imagine trying to sell something, but without being there. So um, that's to me where the, the mastery of, of copy and why it's so important. It's, it's a process of being able to, to have an intimate conversation with someone without being present. And, um, it's something that, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's even intuitive for people or not, but it's definitely not easy. You know, it's something that takes practice and, and mastery and, and, uh, and in building a business online with this idea of, you know, doing anything that's one to many, it's at some point in the evolution of a business, it's absolutely necessary. It's critical. Um, that's, that's to me why it's so important. I mean, that, that question though, what would you, like if, if, 
so I'm someone who is always uncomfortable selling. I, I, I didn't have that experience that Chris had. I'm not a natural, uh, I gotta watch the mental programming. I, at one point I wasn't a natural salesperson or let, let's just say I never was a natural salesperson, but I got really good at selling online. But you, you know, I think like if you have to make a sale, like if your life depended on it, if your life, you know, it just absolutely depended on it, you'd probably wanna be face to face with someone and one-on-one -on -one with them. That's going to be the easiest selling environment. You know, I know some people are uncomfortable with selling, but still you can read the, you can read their body language, you can read their eyes, you can ask them questions, you can hear their tonality, and you don't have any of that with copy. And it, it is an interesting thing. So I think like, you know, with me pioneering the launch and product launch formula, a lot of that tried to simulate that that one-on-one -on -one selling in that, you know, there's, you're always looking for feedback, always looking for comments. You're trying to, I call it, read the tea leaves of the overall conversation within the launch. So it's not just, you know, you're not getting the feedback from an individual person, but you're, you're getting a lot of feedback from the market to figure out what's going on in their collective minds. One of the things that, uh, that you, we heard earlier from Dan as well is, I think a really important word that we even speak about is positioning. And I don't know if we've really addressed how your copy necessarily impacts your positioning, but I think that that might be a really important thing for people to understand before we dig deeper on sort of the nitty gritty of what makes good copy. Yeah, I think for me, positioning is paramount. Uh, I don't know how I figured that out early on, but I did probably by watching other people in the market. Um, you know, Chan Reese was uh, amazing at positioning. Frank Kern's amazing at positioning. To me, like position, like like there's your copy, and then your but your copy lives in this overall big container, which is your positioning. So, like you know, Chris, at the beginning of this, you asked me, you know, basically you asked me to position myself a little bit. You said, okay, you know, tell people why you know why we can talk about this topic, <laughs> yeah. why we know what we're talking about, um, and. So that sort of presupposes that someone might be listening to this who has no idea about any of my backstory, our backstory, what we've done in the market, and that which is a great, a, you know, that's a great best practice. But the reality is, is most of the time when I go out into the market with copy, like if an email that I send to my people on my list, or I get in a webinar, people that are, are generally coming in and they they have a understanding of my brand, my positioning, how who I am. And, and what my strengths are and what I stand for. And so it's almost like positioning, it's almost like brand in a way if, or a personal brand, but it's how you're perceived in the market. And it's it's absolutely critical. And everything you're doing is either building or degrading your, your positioning and, and your copy is going to be building or degrading your positioning. And, and like if you're going for the sale, if you're in the middle of a promotion and you're going for the sale, it's sometimes I see people really make this mistake often where they'll just sell out so hard that, you know, hey, I'll I'll drive over to your house and I'll I'll actually move into your spare bedroom and I'll teach you how to do this thing. And it's not great for your positioning. So um yeah, you you really have to think about your positioning all the time. It, it that's that's sort of the lever that your copy um uses over and over and over so if i'm writing something and it might say uh undermine the very thing i'm actually trying to do it's going to make uh it's it's something i have to be aware of and avoid say going down that path um are there other kind of pitfalls that people fall into that you see uh i mean do you guys watch the industry and see like oh man that's that's bad copy or oh man like that this person's definitely made some mistakes and are there are there mistakes that people could be able to to know or or spot um, in their own copy? I mean, I I think that it's something. I think everybody makes mistakes from time to time. I think it's it's an easy thing to do. Um, so yeah, I I think I've seen different times in um, copy for most people in the industry where they might have you know made made something you know said something that later they might have been like oh dang. Um, but I think it's 
I think that positioning piece is often where that comes into play. Like, you know, you could have one particular email that might not be the most powerful email ever, and maybe it's not intended to be the most powerful email ever. You know, I know uh, even within the emails that we write and the copy that we put out, there are some that, you know, we slave over and there's, you know, so much attention paid to it, or there could be a, um, you know, a registration page for a live event or something that we're spending hours and hours and hours on. And then there might be just an email for a blog video that's going out. And it's like, okay, that, that doesn't need to have a huge amount of attention. Um, but I think the one thing that, 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 that positioning piece is the piece that's so key to, to not stray from too much. Um, because if you start sending out stuff that positions you in a bad light, um, or just in a way that not even bad, like, oh, it, you know, casts a bad light on you, but, um, you know, makes you seem like less of an authority than you are. Those are the pieces that uh, will probably have that longer term impact. Uh, I'll give an example. I once saw someone do a big launch for, say, for a $2,000 product, and they did a really great launch, fantastic launch, sold a boatload, had amazing, great, everything about it was great. And then uh, a month later, they were promoting someone else's product as a as a JV partner, as a joint venture partner, as an affiliate partner, and as a bonus, they if you bought this affiliate product, this product that they were selling as an affiliate, if you bought that product, they would give you that two thousand dollar product that they had just sold the month before for free. Mm. So like, I made that mistake. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Days. Sorry we talk about you, Justin. Just but... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, well, it actually wasn't you when I, when I told that story. I wasn't thinking about it. But I mean, it's like the position of like, I'm this person. You, you have this amazing position that you built in the launch of this person who's selling this $2,000 product and creating great impact and helping people and all this. And then, you know, a month later, it's like, oh, you know, that product, <laughs> other people paid two grand, but here, I'll give it away for free. Not, that's not good positioning. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think that's where Dan was going was, was you know, yeah, you, it, every piece of copy doesn't have to be perfect. But, yeah, people can really screw up their positioning. And and, I'm, and to answer your question, Chris, I mean, I also, there's a lot of great copy out there. I see a lot of really good copy. It's like, oh, man, I wish I wrote that. You know, so it's like, yeah. In fact, it's getting better. I mean, people are getting more sophisticated and they're using ChatGPT to get a start. And, you know, yeah, so one of the things I've, I've heard as a tip for people is that they create what they call like an inspo file or inspiration file of, oh, this is great copy. And they just throw that stuff in there. And then when they are ready to write their own copy, they go in there and kind of read over a bunch of good things that made, made them move. I think is that what you're getting across is that good copy moves you, right? It takes you to the next step. And so, uh, do you guys have that? Do you have like an inspo fire that you file that you go in and be like, oh man, I could get inspired by this to write awesome copy before you get into writing your own stuff? Yeah, I think, um, you know, what in the, what copywriters would call a swipe file, um, other people might have different names for it, but I think that's absolutely critical. I don't know what I would do without it, frankly. I would, I would be spending way too much time to write really poor copy without it. <laughs> I mean, that's just the truth. You know, I, I know, um, I had a business partner. My the biggest business I've built was with a woman named Callan Rush, and as a, she was my business partner, she was the face of that brand primarily, and uh, and she's quite a gifted copywriter in her own right, and uh, she would often say that uh, copywriting to her means the right to copy, and you know and, and you know you want to be careful. It's not you don't take that to an extreme. It's not a copy paste send you know <laughs> uh, scenario, but. Uh, yeah, when it comes to really great ideas and and hooks and frames and stuff like that, that you when you're and they they can be in your market or not, but things that inspire you, really great copy. Um, yeah, you should be copying, pasting that, saving it somewhere for your own inspiration at some point, hundred percent. That that little part there feels so important. The part that it doesn't have to be in your market, it doesn't have to be in any way related to what you're teaching or saying. Um, you know, it, it can be anything that you see out in the world that you're like, oh, I love the way that they communicated that. And then you think, okay, cool. How, how can I do that for myself? How can I do that for my business? How can I do that for my copy? A hundred percent on the swipe file. Um, I'm saving stuff. I, I, I captured a bunch of stuff yesterday. 
I mean, literally, like a bond form sales letter, an order form, an offer, because it just gives, yeah, it's, it's very, very rare that I'll actually like take, uh, what I'll use it for is I'll look at the structure. How did they structure this offer? How did they structure this sales letter? What blocks were in the sales letter? And then like, why was that block in there? What question was that answering? And did I answer that? And do I need to answer it? Uh, so, and I'd love to have um, different swipes for different types of offers. You know, there's the there's the two thousand dollar offer. There's the forty seven dollar offer. There's the twenty five thousand dollar offer, the mastermind offer, the coaching offer, the 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 online course offer, the membership site offer, and then yeah, going sort of going uh, tangential and looking at other industries, a hundred percent, hundred percent. It's um, you know. Yeah, it's just inspiration um, and just, you know, leveraging someone else's thinking. One of the things that uh, I've heard you mention before, uh, Jeff, specifically, is that you have your voice that you're speaking to people with through your copy. And uh, that when we've been, say, hiring copywriters or bringing people in, it's one of the things you're looking for is people who can capture your voice. And you've even said that Dan is one of the people who is very aligned to know, like, what your voice is, which makes sense, right? I mean, <laughs> he was taught from, from a kid to, to do copywriting. Um, so could you speak or could I have all of you speak a little bit on how you think about voice or what that is? Because it feels like that's almost, is that the art side of the of of this or is it more of a science is there a science to voice that people can think about in terms of finding their own or finding something that captures their audience yeah i i mean mine might be a bit of a controversial view on it um because i think it's super important but i think it's also overrated like um you know well like because this idea of our copy needs to create this intimacy, right? So you're saying, well, if someone's going to write on Jeff's behalf, they have to nail his, his voice. Well, that's true because if, when the, if the reader, especially if they have a pre-existing um, relationship with Jeff, they need to believe that Jeff wrote it in the moment, right? Otherwise, that's going to be a huge disconnect. That would be the opposite of intimacy. And if they don't know Jeff, whatever whatever relationship is being formed in that copy needs to be congruent with later copy that Jeff will have written potentially and will definitely be in his voice, right? It needs to be consistent. So that stuff is true. But the flip side of that is um, that a lot of people I know that w when they go about, or a lot of clients I've had over the years, when they go about having their companies growing and they need to be outsourcing their copy or, or building a copy team or whatever. They use this voice as a, as a reason to get, to dig back into it. Like the voice, it's always a problem. Like they don't write in my voice. They don't write on my voice. But typically what that means is that they don't write like they write, but they're writing poor copy in most <laughs> cases. And, um, and the reality is, is that good copy, it's not, it's not your voice. Like if, if Jeff were to write like he speaks, it would be ineffective because, you know, uh, when we're, when we're speaking, we're like right now, I'm gesticulating with my, with my hands as an example, or, you know, when you're with someone, you make eye contact or, um, you, the way that we speak with, we, we can alter the cadence or the volume, or there's all kinds of tools that we use let's say when we're telling a great story or something, but you can't just, you know, if it was just nailing the voice, well, we could just copy and paste a transcript and put it in an email or put it on a sales page. But this is not how it works. You know, this is not what makes compelling copy. So when it comes to this idea of nailing the voice, I think that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a happy medium somewhere. Um, it's important, but also, you know, not the, not the be all end all that some people think it is, in my opinion. I think, I think going on that, I think maybe the term voice is almost a little misleading in some ways. Cause like Justin said, yeah, it's not literally how someone would speak. I think to me, it feels more almost like the, the underlying theme or the underlying kind of core message or way of communicating, um, 
it's almost like a culture, I guess you could say. Like, um, so say like take product launch formula and Jeff for an example. Like people who are learning, people who are um, the people that we connect with the most. They're people who they're starting an online business. They're probably pretty smart. They're probably pretty passionate about something. They're looking to start a business, but they're not looking to go like hard line selling. Um, they probably want to go about it. Like maybe they, they think that they're not particularly good at sales or something. They're looking for a method in which they can kind of just share what they know and have that lead into connecting with the people that um, connecting with their audience and then making sales from it without having to be like, okay, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. You have to do this or else, you know, you're going to suck at life, like buy this thing, you know? Um, and so they resonate with that, with um, messaging that kind of follows in that sort of theme. So if we were to be sending emails that were like, buy my thing or else you're going to suck at life, you freaking loser, like it's going to turn them off as an extreme example, but it's going to turn them off because that's not the sort of, um, struggling for a great word here to encapsulate it but i'm always feeling like if you are in a room with all of your people um it's like the culture of that room um and you want your messaging to kind of be congruent or you want to be congruent with that and that i guess that's how i think about voice yeah i i think you're right on dan um when i think about it yeah they're they're like hitting my tone my voice and for everyone out there you know i we have a, a copy team now and they write a lot of our copy. I write some of it. They write a lot of it. I wrote the first ten thousand or twenty thousand emails, um, but they 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 mostly write it now. And there might be a few colloquialisms, and I think I I write in a friendly, authoritative manner. Uh, it's a very encouraging. I think is the voice, but I think it's more the tone than the voice. And like Dan, like Dan was saying, it's like. You know, there are people in the world that just live to be marketers. They, they don't care what they're selling. They just love marketing and love the marketing process. Or there's people like that with sales. They just want to sell. They don't care what they're selling. They just love that sales process. And those people are generally not our people. And, you know, there's, there's other people that serve them, and that's all fang, fantastic. And sometimes we get a few of those folks, but mostly our folks, are they're, they tend to be um, either freedom driven that they want to create freedom in their lives or they want to create impact and they want to help people and those are generally the people we attract into our community and that do the best in our community and they grow these amazing businesses in our community and so when our tone I think has to be to them like if you even look back throughout the when I've spoken here and I I said copy you know copy if I was had a different audience I might have when in that first intro, I'm like, copy is the way you turn words into money. That would be a very, you know, very sexy, very, hmm. you know, grabby way to say it. But I didn't say that because most of the people listening to me, it's not more, it's, it's as much about the freedom. Yeah, they want money. Money's great. Money's fantastic. I love money. But it's about the freedom or it's about the impact or getting their work out into the world or creating flexibility. And so I think you're, Dan's right, it, 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 and Justin as well. It's not, I mean, there's some, at least for us, there's some voice, but it's, it's as much as the tone and how we speak peop to people and how we, we address people. I keep wanting yeah, to snap, but then that'll probably just abuse everyone. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, we have this in, in our, um, in our, both for our team and for in our, like our mastermind community, we have this convention where people will, uh, if you hear something you agree with, you just snap your fingers. And I know that means different things around the world to different people. And I know people are going to be hearing this from all over, but that in our world, that snapping your fingers means you agree. And that's, that's what Justin was just referencing there. And you know, in here, we're all just speaking using ourselves and Jeff's voice as an example here. Um, but they're just examples. Um, you know, I think of Jeff's voice as being kind of like the humble badass sort of like, you know, you have the, we're in a market where there's a lot of money going around and there's a lot of people who can go from, you know, sort of unknown. And then they do a, you know, they do a $4 million launch or whatever. And it's like, so we're, we're not targeting the people 
for the most part. We're not targeting the people who are, okay, they do the million dollar launch and, you know, they've got all the Instagram clips and they're, you know, rolling up in the brand new Lamborghini and stepping out in the thousand dollar sneakers and, you know, kind of flashing like, you know, hey, I'm in this place with this person, I'm in this place with this person. You know, it's the guy who's, you know, walking into the local breakfast joint in a t-shirt and, you know, just kind of sits down, has his cup of coffee, whips out a laptop and writes an email that makes a million bucks. You know, it's like that sort of like that understated sort of badass type feel. I think that's, that's who our audience wants to be. Um, they, and so when we write in a way that um, conveys that like we or Jeff is that, then that helps bring that connection. It makes them feel like, oh yeah, this is my person. This is my mentor to follow. Yeah, and, and that's a great point from Dan, is that like, that's who that's who our market is. That's who the market that we found that has found us, that works for us, that we love. I love those folks. I, um, but you know, if your market is the thousand dollar sneaker people, then you know, all your copies should reflect that. You should own it. So it's like, we're writing to our audience the way that works for us. And, and I guess congruence is, is the key. Like your copy has to be congruent. It has to be congruent with your, with your positioning and your brand. It has to be congruent with the offer. It has to be congruent with the impact that you're seeking to make for, for, for your clients, for your future clients. And yeah, if they want the thousand dollar sneakers and you're, and that's your jam, then go for it. It just, it all has to be congruent. That's what your copy has to, to support. Mm -hmm. I think it transitions what you both what you just said, Jeff, and what Dan are saying kind of a segues into, you know, the, the fundamentals of of great copy. You know, I, I think hopefully for anyone if they're just learning, it doesn't seem intimidating, you know, like the idea of being good at it. Because the fundamentals are really, you know, just having a really firm understanding and who it is you're talking to and what problems do they have and and how are you going to articulate you know the problems and the ways that you can help them you know um you know even with regards to you know dan was making a joke about the four million dollar launch that you referred to jeff and there's you know it comes to product launch formula like how many how many massive launches have there been out out there over the years like i don't know lots there's been a lot and um, when, when either Jeff or now his, you know, our team on behalf of this idea of product launch formula, the product or the coaching program, you know, how often do you hear about those big launches? You know, n never, never talk about them. You know, we talk about the, the, the six figure launch, you know, the, the beginner that does their very first launch that did 50,000 or even 15,000 or, you know, I said six figures, you know, sometimes hundred, 150, but the reason for that is why that's great copy aside from all the the techniques of what to say and how to say it it's just the fundamental of being aware who who are we talking to here and where are they at and how can we help them and um that to me is is the fundamental and if 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 people really anyone who's starting out if you have a really firm grasp of the fundamentals of what you're doing and why you're doing it you're going to write good copy. And if you are in that spot of starting out and you're like, well, okay, I got to figure that out. It's like very likely for, I find for most people, um, that person that you're writing to is like often a past version of yourself. If you're an entrepreneur and you're teaching someone how to do something that you learned because you were solving a problem in your own life, or you're teaching something that's a passion of yours that you learned, um, most of the time that person that you're writing to is just the earlier version of yourself. It's you, it's you um, before you learned all your skills. It's you when you were on that learning journey. So you probably have a really great resource to draw from of figuring out what does this person really care about and what do they really struggle with? Because it's the same thing that you really cared about and you really struggled with when you were starting out, when you were in their spot. Great points. You know, I want to just underline what Justin Justin just said something that I've never talked about. And that is, um, so like, 
I, I love to feature the success stories of my students just because I love to be their champion. I love to give them exposure. And it also makes selling a lot easier for me when I can show just what's possible. And so we have done literally our case study page right now is over a hundred case studies on it of people in every niche, every market, you know, every language, everywhere in the world doing all kinds of different launches. And none of those, I think the biggest of those launches might be a couple hundred thousand dollars. A lot of them are a hundred thousand, a lot of them are 10,000, you know, 12,000, 14,000. There isn't, I've never published a single case study of any of our people that have done million dollar launches or multi-million dollar launches. In fact, I've, you know, I'm on the string. I think the last time I did a launch that wasn't a multi-million dollar launch was in 2005. You never hear me talk about my multi-million dollar launches. You don't hear my, me talk, talk about my students' multi-million dollar launches. Um, and even though it, it would look, it make me look really cool to my marketing buddies if I was talking about those great big launches. I, you know, they they'd be impressed. It'd be it'd impress my buddies, but it would it would not serve the people I'm trying to reach, which are generally a lot closer to the beginning of their journey. And they would either look at those and say, um, for, I just don't believe that's possible. Or they would say, that might be possible, but there's just no way it's possible for me. I can't relate to that. It would be like if you were teaching me how to shoot free throws in basketball and you started talking to me like if I was in the seventh game of the NBA Finals shooting that free throw, I, I can't relate. And so the typical person coming into my world can't relate to a seven-figure or a multi-seven-figure launch. So I never, ever, ever have ever talked about them. And just because I understand my market. And a lot of people would think like, oh, this is, this is the, absolutely the thing you'd want to talk about. This is your greatest success stories in some ways. There's a, uh, there's an, we're going to do some opinions in a second, but one of the opinions, maybe we want to just dive into it now is that, uh, I, I read this, uh, while I was doing some research for this on copywriting, but like a guy was saying, may, you know, you can make big promises or, you know, a, there's an opinion that you should make, uh, more achievable, smaller promises for people. And I'm curious, what is your opinion on that for people when they're creating copy? Is it better to make the big promise like that? Or is there a way of thinking about it that I'm not thinking about? I think that's pretty contextual. Like, you know, even even though Jeff's saying, you know, for the talking about the audience of a coaching pro, particular coaching program where he's not boasting about these grandiose things, you know, I think the idea of someone taking a, a product for the first time or something that they've put their life work into that hasn't really been established in the market and doing that first successful campaign that brings in a flood of business, okay, what, whatever flood means to them, that's a, that's a big promise. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't label that as a, as a small promise just because it's not in the millions. Um, so I think on a, on a campaign level, I'm totally fine with people making big promises. Now, along the way in a campaign, when you're in different communications, you know, maybe with on a landing page or in a specific email or even on a video or something like that, does it make sense to have things that are really hook driven and instant gratification and, and smaller? You know, a lot of times the most, the highest converting thing you can do in copy is to make the smallest promise possible in my estimation and that's simply to give someone an awareness of something no no result beyond just hey you're going to know something you didn't know before you know like you uh, asked in the beginning of this call as an example for us to come up with a mistake a copywriting mistake right well what what does that how does that serve anyone beyond just giving them this it's just an awareness of something there's no value above and beyond that but it's a great hook and it gets the it gets it move gets the process moving gets the relationship started gets that initial interest, um, so in a lot of times that's superior copy to take that approach. So, yeah, it's it's it, so a couple of words have come up just in the last few minutes that we hadn't used before that are very important words. And um, one was you, you promise you use the word promise, 
and Justin used the word campaign. And one of the way I, the, I don't have my flip chart here, so I can't draw it out. But the way I think about it is there's, you know, you have copy, which is <laughs> ostensibly what we're talking about on this call. But you're, you're any piece, any individual piece of copy lives within the campaign. And so, like Justin said, I mean, the, you might you might have one promise or, or one hook or one thing you're that that you're offering on your opt-in page because someone's coming in cold. They don't know who you are. They don't believe you. You can't just say, "Give us your email. And we'll teach you how to make a million dollars," or uh, "Give us your email. And we'll teach you how to play Stairway to Heaven." You know, like all the way through with no mistakes. Or maybe that would work, but but you know the. If someone's coming in cold, doesn't know you, and you're just looking for an email, you don't promise them the world. You take it a step at a time. So you, anyways, going back, you have copy, and that copy lives within a campaign. And to me, that campaign lives within an offer. Like, And we could argue how I would draw this out. And since I'm not drawing it out, we did, we'll never know. But, you know, all that campaign serves whatever that offer is going to be. And the offer is incredible. Getting the offer right is, is just as important as getting your copy right. And, and that was a little bit of a pun there. Getting your offer right is just as important as getting your copy right. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, this is a little inside joke. I, I cannot <laughs> stand puns. And uh, Dan loves puns. So, um, and, and in any case, but then within that, the idea of your offer you know, which is what you're going to give people and how you're going to transform their lives is this idea of the promise. Like, what's the overall promise you're making with that campaign that, that you're driving people to? Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to sort of flesh out a couple more terms. I can't remember what the... Oh, what was it? A big promise or small promise? Yeah. I don't know. Dan, looked like you had an opinion on that. Did you have something? I, I mean, I think, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the big promise that... The big promise that you're selling... There's probably a lot of people selling that same big promise because the big promise is the overall dream, right? So it's it might be hard to be, say, exactly a point of opt-in, like Jeff was saying, like when someone's first giving you their email address. If you're just selling the big promise, that yeah, you just might not really stand out that much. And they honestly might just not believe you that much. So it is about like what sort of to me, I think it's like, you got to keep the big promise in mind. You got to think about what's their big overall dream, their big overall goal. And throughout the course of a campaign, which, you know, is probably going to be many emails, multiple, you know, many points of contact long, um, you know, you could reference that big promise. And at times, you know, especially if you're at a time where you have a lot of buy-in from someone in the room, someone's really um, invested in you and in your message and what you're talking about then like say when they're in a launch like when you're in a launch and they're really in your launch sequence i think that's what justin's talking about those are the times when you can give that big promise um but a lot of times it's like okay what like how i think about it is what small promise can you make and then can you fulfill upon for that person quickly so that you've actually benefited them in some way um and then they start to believe you and they start to be like, oh, okay, this person knows their stuff. Um, and if you can give them another little small promise, you can fulfill on that small promise. You know, you're going to teach them how to do this. You're going to show them how to do this. And then you do that. Then it starts to make the whole thing feel more real to them. And then they start to kind of, they start to buy in. They start to believe like, okay, I, I get that this person knows what they're talking about. And they've given me these small steps that are moving me forward. I can like start to dare to believe a little bit in the big promise. This brings up another uh, question I have about about good copy is, do you have a process for how you test your copy to know whether or not it actually is working or it works in the way that you're talking about? So I give you this small promise and it actually gets someone a win. I can, you know, Justin's I'm, nodding, I'm, so I'm, 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 I'm looking at you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I have to be probably the most frustrating person to ever ask questions to because my answer is always the same. It depends. It's contextual, right? So, I mean, the, the answer is, I mean, the answer is yes, but it's different depending on what the, excuse me, depending on what the copy is. So is, is there a way of testing, you know, email copy? Yeah, absolutely there is. Is there a way of testing landing page copy or sales page copy? Yes. Or, you know, video or the offer itself. The answer is yes to all of those, but all of those processes are totally different. And 
the reason why, I mean, it should would probably be, be obvious that the reason why the testing mechanics have to be different is because the, the components of each of those are different and the objective is different. So um, I think I'm a huge fan of testing. I think that everything should be tested to the painstaking degree, whatever painstaking degree is possible. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let someone else chime in, but it's going to be different depending on what, what you're testing. Yeah, I I mean, some things are a lot easier to test than others. Uh, you know, landing pages are easy to test. Email subject lines are easy to test. Prices are hard to test. Offer components are hard to test just because you the, the actions, you know, on, on an opt-in page, the action is they opt-in or don't opt-in. It's really easy to drive a bunch of traffic and get a bunch of decisions. But if you're selling something where the the where you're testing the offer or you're testing the price and it's the actual, the the, the decision is whether they buy or not, it's just going to be a lot harder to get those decisions, enough decisions to be statistically significant. Um, so some things are easier to test than others. I will say that some, there's also, um, you know, testing's amazing and some, and, and, and using uh, anecdotal evidence um, can be equally, I mean, like there's just sometimes where you get an offer right or you get a hook right and it's just like, it's just like you're in a rocket ship and all of a sudden it just takes off. You know, we just That's recently cool. had that with one of our promotions where we were struggling, 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 made a change, made a significant change to the whole frame of the offer and it was just like explosive. It was like, you didn't need to split test that one. It's like when we made three times as many sales you know, as we had in a day, as we had in the last week, it's like, okay, something we're, we're onto something here. And then you start testing from there, but yeah. Yeah. That, that, um, you could say anecdotal or slightly less scientific, um, or maybe not even less science. Yeah. Less scientific, but also just less numbers based sort of, um, testing to me, that feels like something that, that Jeff and Justin are both fantastic at. Um, and Justin, maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, and, and so obviously for people listening, you know, we're able to be a little more sophisticated. Um, we've got a lot of campaigns worth of data to look back at that have had a lot of traffic going through them. So we have a lot of resources to pull on, but I know we've had times where say, um, we like, we either did or didn't get a lot of people, like just as an example, we either did or did not get a lot of people showing up live to a live broadcast or a live stream or a live event or something like that. And then we're curious as to why. And so um, I've seen this a lot where Justin will dig into the data. He'll go back and he'll say, okay, so we had these emails and then compare these, e compare the email, the registration emails to the registration emails from another previous similar event and saying like, okay, yeah, it seems like the messaging was, um, um, you know, we, we kind of hit the same targets. We wrote similar sort of feeling copy. It all seemed pretty good. And we had really good registration numbers for both events. And then the last time we ran an event that was similar to this, um, this is how many emails we sent. This was sort of the context of them. And we had these many people, this percentage of people showing up live. And then now for this current one, um, you know, we're similar things all throughout, but we have less people showing up live or more people showing up live. And I know you can kind of, you end up digging into it and saying like, you know, it's not perfectly scientific, but it seems like you get a pretty good read on how well the hooks are working, not working. Yeah, what I'm hearing is don't just th show it to your friend and say, what do you think? Because it well, sounds like you have to put things out to the world to actually really test it and actually get your stuff out there to see if the actions you're trying to get actually get taken. Unfortunately, you know, so. One, one thing I've noticed, um, I'll mention this so that people can not make this mistake. And, you know, we're talking about this idea of testing and to rely on testing and data. Um, one thing I've noticed that uh, have, having the opportunity to write copy for other people. So let's say it's an entrepreneur, you know, like let's say Chris, that we'll just say hypothetically, in your business, you hired me to write copy. If you're like most people, the, tr the reality is, is that I'm writing to you, not your client. Because mm -hmm. what's going to happen is I'm going to write copy and then how it gets assessed will be how you feel about it. Right. Typically. And that's a huge mistake. 
huge mistake that that uh, that people make. Whereas um, if if I'm a good copywriter and you're empowering me to uh, you know as a tool to help leverage your your business and scale your your business and and whatnot and to free up your time, my copy should be judged on its efficacy, right? What what let's say it's email copy, right? And we're wanting to drive traffic to a specific page or whatever we're testing for. How effective is it at meeting that objective as opposed to your personal opinion on whether or not, you know, the copy's good? Um, most people d do it that latter way, which is a huge, huge mistake. And then you have, you know, this industry of, of copywriters, you know, who want, they're writing to the wrong audience and, and, and therefore the, the copy is compromised. So, um, yeah. So for anyone building their, but when it comes time for you to leverage the medium of copywriters, make sure that you're, that you're assessing their copy, um, properly. Hey, launch family, Chris coming at you. We'll get back to wrap up our copy conversation in just a minute. But first, I wanted to let you know about two things we've added to our Dare to Launch bonus vault just for you listening to this episode. First, you'll get to uh, see a 15-minute clip from this conversation where Jeff and Justin have differing opinions on what grade level you should be writing your copy for. And because we wanted to give you something extra special, you'll also find a copy of Jeff's Eight Rules for Copywriting so you can start writing copy that gets read and really gets results. So go to daretolaunchshow.com forward slash taco, enter your email, and get access to the bonus vault where we put all our show's bonuses and extra content and goodies. Uh, that's daretolaunchshow.com forward slash taco taco to get access to Jeff's eight rules of copy and more bonus content. Now back to the show. This might be a great space for a two minute taco break. If you would humor me for, for that, uh, I'd love to ask some rapid fire, non copy related questions just to get a little, our, our team loves tacos. And, uh, I would, I think people would love to know, uh, what are your opinions on tacos? Since we've had some pretty strong opinions on languages so far, uh, let's uh, let's do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around. I'm going to do it's kind of rapid fire. So I'm not looking for a life story of why you think this is the best way to have a taco. I just want to know the answer. That's it. All right. Um, and we'll start. I'll go in order of we'll go Dan, Jeff, Justin. Does that sound work? All right, I'm getting nods for you, those of you who yes. are listening. Yes. All right. All right. It's a closed caption. I'll nod. All right. First rapid fire question here soft shell or hard shell? Hard shell is a waste of time. Oh, my goodness. If, it, if anyone says hard shell, if any listener thinks hard shell, I hope they hang up right now. I don't even want to. Well, let, let's not judge. Let's not judge. We, no, I but, judge. But yeah, I mean, hard shells are for Taco Bell. <laughs> hard shell. hard right, shells gotta... are for hard heads. I know. I'm hard shell is if you enjoy, like, getting cut while you're eating your taco. It's, All right. Corn yeah. tortilla well, also losing or half flour it. tortilla? Flour tortilla. Corn. 100% corn. Oh, we got dissent Corn's here. harder to do, but when it's done, I, I, I'm, I'm Mr. Gluten-Free right now, so it's corn for me. All right. Uh, when it's, it's be, done yeah, well, it's, it's almost as good. Be good corn. It's yeah, be I mean, good. it's it's hard to do corn well, but That's when right. they do it well, yeah. Uh, it's so almost as good as flour. Would you say, all right, would you say spicy <laughs> or mild taco? Spice, spicy. What are, what are you doing? Go for it. Yeah, spicy. I'm yeah spicy, but I always pay for it later. We which we won't get into the details of that, but definitely tastes uh, way better. Cilantro, no cilantro. Cilantro. <laughs> you I, seem offended it, by the question. It, <laughs> I mean, it, it's a, it's the chef's choice. I mean, it's like yeah, but I'm not. Be, I think behind that question are the people that are go a little nuts about cilantro. Well, some people, I, I have friends who cilantro. can't have cilantro at all because it tastes like soap to them. And so yeah, I've, heard yeah. I have those friends yeah. too. And I want to do laundry. Too. I'll reach for cilantro, but not in my <laughs> meal. Thank you. So that's um, why I always what are your like, <laughs> what would be your three must haves on a taco outside of sort of the core meat? Oh man. I, it, it's, that's, that's like saying there's only one right way to have a taco, which is just, I don't know, a very right. limiting way to think about the world. 
Yeah, I'm going to go it's the chef's choice, like whatever they're putting together. I mean, yeah. Yeah, great talk. But, but like at Gaspacho's last week, it was the carne asada. Um, they do, they they put cheese on some, it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's some veggies. And, and then you put honey and on it veggies, and then hot sauce. Honey, honey. Which that might be a little controversial for some. The folks. honey was That's a little just... strange to me. I'd never seen a honey on it was taco delicious. before, but you know what? Kind of works. Kind of works, Whoa, especially yeah. honey and beef. Kind of works. Yeah. It was epic. It was <laughs> so good. I don't know Justin if I'm buying honey for my next taco night, but uh, I'll. I think. <laughs> well, well I no, you don't put them. You don't just put honey on every taco, though. You put honey on those tacos. <laughs> on those. Yeah, yeah. they get spatulas tacos. If I had right. the new taco vegan. Tuesday tacos. If I had to pick an ingredient, it would be avocado, which Jeff will sadly never know the wonders. You don't like avocado? avocado. Uh, no, I'm I'm like way really? allergic. Like, oh. like <laughs> I get like really sick. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. All right, last one. Uh, Taco Tuesday or Taco Thursday? Taco every day. Why not both? <laughs> of course. Yeah. You say that like it's a choice. Yeah, that's a silly question. What All about right, taco, yeah. like Taco Monday, Taco Wednesday? You feel like you're leaving some options out here. I was just trying to stick with alliteration, you know? So, but even though Thursday is kind of like that. Well, Wicked that Taco Wednesday. Taco two minute break <laughs> <laughs> right there. Uh, thanks for, for that. What I, uh, I guess, um, just to say, uh, Justin, I know you had to go. How are we doing on time? Do we have like five minutes? I'm Do late, we have two so. minutes? Do we have 10 minutes? All right. So let's just finish it off and wrap okay. things up here. All right. I wanted to go around. Is there any final thoughts on or insights on today's topic, uh, your final minute? I, I'll just jump in here quick to kick off. Um, Jeff said it earlier, but I think one really big thing is just keeping in mind that they, they meaning just people out there in the world they they don't care um the fact that someone has signed up for your email list doesn't necessarily mean that they believe you it doesn't mean that they follow you it doesn't mean that they believe you it doesn't mean that they trust you it doesn't mean that they consume everything you put out it doesn't mean that they're interested um the fact that they haven't unsubscribed is in my mind basically all that you have like there's some little bit of a promise or a little bit of interest that's keeping them from unsubscribing and you have to sell um, them believing in you, them being interested in you, and them being consuming your content every single time you put something out to them. I think, um, man, if I could, there's lots of things going on in my mind right now, but I think if people were to focus on one thing, oh, it would be, yeah, to focus on one thing. Like at any given time, one idea, one concept, you know, one call to action, keep things really, uh, really simple. Uh, but I, yes, to both of those. Um, and I guess I probably would have picked those two as my first two. Um, so the third point would be that every, well, like every piece of copy has a purpose. So know what that purpose is. And, you know, sometimes you might send an email or put out a social post and it's really just about building your relationship with your audience. And that's fine. But know what the purpose of every piece of copy is. And then to drill down, say like you have maybe a sales letter or a sales video or or an email. It's like that whatever your subject and whatever your headline is in, in an email, it's your subject line and who it's from. In a video, it's the first words you say, but the 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 whole point of that headline is just to pull them in and get them to read the next sentence. And the job of the next sentence or the subhead is to get them to read the next sentence. And you and you have to look at it that way. I mean, I, I don't want this to sound too overwhelming, um, because and you can get good at this. You can get good at this, but it's it, this is the one magic skill that literally can take you from wherever you are to wherever you want to be. You know, Gary Halbert famously said the answer to every business problem is, is a sales letter. And I believe that being able to write copy is the ultimate power up, the ultimate force multiplier, the ultimate skill in, in our types of, types of businesses. 
And so you're not going to be great at it overnight, but you can you can you can get great at it. But you have to, yeah. No, like Dan said, they they just don't care. They just don't care. That you have to make them care. And like Justin said, you have the, that you can only be selling one thing at a time, whether it's a click or it's actually getting them to pull out their credit card. And then just knowing what you know. Anytime you sit down to create, whether it's a video or social or email or whatever, knowing what the purpose of that copy is, is absolutely paramount. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in. Thanks to Dan, Justin, and of course my co-host Jeff, as we talk through these stories and once again, signing out, we dare you to launch. Bye everyone. on the next episode of Dare to Launch. If I create anything, if I create a launch, if I create a webinar, if I just write a sales letter or construct an email that leads to a sale, anything that I do is in a sequence, a very particular psychological sequence that ultimately leads to a sale, right? Um, and that sequence can be pretty long or it can be pretty short, but I'm doing things in there. I'm, it's like, first I, have to, I may have to hook to get attention. So, all right, now that I've hooked to get attention, now I have to build trust, and now I have to build authority, and now I have to move to the next sequence, which maybe I, I, I may have to start future pacing, I may have to start trial closing, I may have to start, I have to may build authority again, I may have to uh, apply proof. There's so many elements, and, and there's a particular order that I want, a journey that I want to take a prospective client down. Uh, so that it all, ultimately, by the time that we get to the, the to the part of the sale, um, uh, that they are they are basically begging uh, for me to sell them something rather than me, you know, crossing my fingers and, and hoping that when I make the offer that they'll be uh, interested in it, right? <laughs>